participants and public. Uh, we are going into the session number four uh, called uh, Small Countries versus Big Soft Power in Modern Times. And besides Andrea, uh, we will have uh, two other guests, Frances uh, Mr. Francesco Spera and Vanya Drljevic, uh, Ms. Vanya Drljevic, hopefully by the end of your presentation. So, so uh, first presenter is uh, Mr. Uh, Andrea Mirovic, uh, lecturer, Faculty of Law um, at University Mediterranean. Uh, Andrea graduated from uh, College of Law at University of Belgrade in 2021. Um, during his studies, he was awarded uh, he was awarded as one of the best students at the Faculty of Law in Belgrade. He was an active member of the Forum Romanum Club of Legal History Enthusiasts. Uh, with his professional and uh, professors and mentors, he participated in several scientific discussions in the field of Roman law and general legal history. He is a master a master student at the Faculty of Law uh, of the University of Belgrade uh, in the field of history of the state and law uh, module. Um, Andrea, welcome. Um, please, uh, we have. Uh, around 15 minutes per presentation. So go ahead. I see that uh, Miss Vanya Drljevic just joined. Hello, uh, welcome. Uh, and we we are starting for uh, with the first presentation, and then we will go further later. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Balsha. I will speak about cultural diplomacy between Montenegro and Italy through the person of Yelena of Montenegro. Perhaps uh, no person in the relation between uh, Italy and Montenegro, which date back to the Venetian conquest at the end of 14th century, has left a deeper mark on the relation between our two countries. Elena of Montenegro was born on December 1872, which means that uh, in this month we celebrate 150 years from her, from her birth. Her father, then prince and later king of Montenegro, Nicola, had 12 children, but it was Jelena who left the most impressive mark of all the children of the Montenegrin king. At the baptism, godfather was Russian emperor Nicola II, and it was uh, significant her future uh, her and her future husband, the Italian king uh, Victor Emanuele, to meet at the ball in San Petersburg, where she agreed to marry. This marriage laid the foundation for future cooperation and good relation between Montenegro and Italy, perhaps the strongest in history up to that point. In the autumn of the same year, the Italian prince arrived in Montenegro and formally proposed to the beautiful Montenegrin princess in Cetinje. Raised in Orthodox religion, it was difficult for her that she had to convert her religion and in accordance with the customs of that time, move to the Roman Catholic Church in order to become the future queen of Italy. In October 19, uh, 1896, after the all religion and uh, customary ceremonies, the ship Saviola sailed from the port of Bar to the Italian region of Puglia, where it docked in the city of Bari with the future royal couple. After that, they headed to Rome, where the secular marriage ceremony took place in the Quirinale castle and the spiritual marriage ceremony took place in the church of Saint Maria of Angels. She was remembered by the Italian people as a great humanist. That she would grow up to the true mother of her people could be seen as early as the war year of 1876, when she watched over the wounded people returning from the Montenegrin Turkish war in Cetinje. Although she was only four years old and was the youngest daughter of a Montenegrin prince, she visited the wounded people who were placed in the field hospital on the square with her mother and her sisters. 
the peak of her humanity, for which many Italians want to even canonize her, is an event from 1908 that happened in Sicilia. That year, this Italian island and the city of Messina were hit by a terrible earthquake. When the Italian queen heard about this tragic event and the deaths of tens of thousands of islanders, she immediately dressed in a nurse uniform and went to the earthquake affected area. Although the earthquake were not over yet and uh, were still very active, she did not want to leave the island and stay for almost a month to help the victims. Even in the capital of Italy, in Rome, Yelena's charity was recognized. She was, expect, uh, she was especially uh, concerned with uh, caring for orphans, whom she entrusted to the good Roman families, and she herself often visited that families to make sure that the children were treated properly. Her influence on philanthropy in Italy is perhaps best evidenced by the fact that two hospitals in Italy were named after her. One is located in Cassel and was found by the Queen's personal contribution. And the second is located in Rome and was found as an institute for the treatment of cancer. During the First World War, the Quirinal Castle was by order of Queen Yelena turned into a hospital where the wounded people were treated. After the abdication of her husband, the Queen had lived uh, Italy in uh, 1946 and go to the Egypt, where she also continued her humanitarian work. She died in Montpellier in France in uh, 1952, 70 years ago. Her reputation in Italy is immeasurable, as is her influence on the relation between Montenegro and Italy. In addition, to the two hospitals, which are named in her honor, the most famous liquor produced in Italy was named Amaro Montenegro, of course, thanks to the famous Montenegrin princess and the Italian queen. In the autumn of 2018, the Italian foundation Festiva Pucciniano and the Montenegrin Symphony Orchestra met to pay their respect to Queen Yelena. It was then agreed that the Montenegrin and Italian musician would pay tribute to the great humanitarian in concerts. This is proof that even today, after almost seven decades since the death of Queen Elena, her image and work live on in the relations between Italy and Montenegro. And it was the representative of the Italian foundation who referred to this uh, contribution in Messina in 1908. Unfortunately, for our culture and the overall awareness of personalities who had a great influence for our diplomacy and the reputation in the world, such as Yelena, of course, had, Montenegrin society and government institution are not ready still to take full responsibility for her legacy. I hope this, this, this situation will change in future and that Yelena's memory will be given and adequate, adequate places in our society. Thank you for listening. For uh, the questions for, thank you for the presentations. The question for the presentation, oh my gosh. Um, the questions for you and for the other participants will go after the, the presentations. So, so uh, Mr. Fran uh, Francesco Spera just joined. Hello, Mr. Hello, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry, I apologize. Uh, sorry, Natasha, sorry. I just had the problem uh, with the hotel and the internet. Uh, so I hope we, I hope you can hear me clearly and well uh, because I've been struggling. For the past we can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, very well, very well, very well. Thank you very much. So, so, so um, you were not here for the beginning. Uh, each of participants will have uh, 15 minutes, around yeah. 15 minutes for the presentation, and the questions will go at the end. Uh, so um, a little bit about, uh, let, let me introduce you a little bit. Uh, Mr. Francesco Spera will have um, 
presentation, um, the promotion of EU values through cultural initiatives under EU neighborhood policy and the use of soft law. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at the international law at uh, Unisalento Lecce, Italy. I'm sorry if I pronounce that badly. Uh, he obtained his master's of law in European law uh, at Maastricht University at, and the Louis University of Rome. Currently, he is a PhD candidate uh, in European and international law. His experience covers the field of EU institutional, constitutional, environmental, and uh, external relationships law. Uh, he was admitted to the Body Lawyer Association and he's a, uh, he's a judge attributor. Uh, Mr. Spera collaborates with Italian local entities and public administration in order to implement EU recover and resilient plans. Uh, he has been working for European institution and law firms and he was and still is part of some EU founded projects. So, uh, sir, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation first. It was, uh, it's really a pleasure to be online, unfortunately, with you because uh, I wish next time I will be there. <laughs> Unfortunately, for work reason, I'm in Rome and I'm between another conference on European law, but I will be so happy to, to, to be there. But this is first contact, I will be glad. So I, if you don't mind, uh, may I share the screen that Asa knows already? I have a presentation, some slides, can I? Yeah, okay. Um, so just let me know if you see it. Can you yes, see it's visible? Okay. Yes, perfect. You can go into presentation mode. So yeah, yeah, on the top, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Perfect. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, so what I will, yeah, uh, the, the 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 topic uh, I will be briefly talking about is the role of culture um in the human every policy and the use of a special instrument of soft law um i'm sorry i will be probably talking a bit uh, with uh, legal terms uh, in, a, in a very different uh, uh, environment so i will be probably be boring <laughs> but uh, this is uh, our job and we, we try our best uh, to be entertaining as well um so uh, this is so for the summary of that, uh, I would like to uh, show you a bit what I'm talking about, so you have a clear idea. Uh, so first of all, the, um, the policy itself, the externalization of the EU, uh, the values and the principle of conditionality and culture, the union for the Mediterranean, and you will see briefly what, and uh, what is imposed for the soft law. Um, okay. So uh, what we're talking about is just uh, uh, the role of EU funded projects. Uh, let's say in an holistic sense, the project um, are an example of the participatory governance in practice, uh, uh, often involving uh, society, civil society actors as organizing participants, the projects themselves can be understood as participation in civil society activity. Um, and they're not, primarily about participation decision-making, but creating networks and advancing transnational cooperation, as um, it is probably, and it is, for instance, in cross-border projects uh, between, for instance, my region, Puglia, and uh, Montenegro, and Albania. Um, and that's that, just to give you an image. And uh, what is, of course, the aim from a European point of view is to create a sense of engagement, European identity and belonging. Uh, so uh, for those who don't know, the European neighborhood policy applies to those countries. And you will see why then I choose the Union for the Mediterranean. And it aims to strengthen 
as they say in the policy documents, prosperity, stability, and security of all, uh, of all these countries. Uh, now, of course, this definition a bit uh, old uh, does not apply to Ukraine, not to understand in a different manner. It is based on uh, democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, and it is a bilateral policy between the EU and partner countries. You will see why and why I'm talking about uh, culture, democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights. And uh, one of these initiatives is the Union for Mediterranean. And we'll see why I'm talking about that. Uh, I'm not dwell too much on this, uh, but uh, this, uh, the, um, this policy is based on this part of the treaties. Uh, the discipline was found there. Uh, it was uh, updated recently. And as you can see in the map, uh, those countries involved uh, are uh, in uh, orange, uh, um, and it's uh, the discipline is about trade, international agreements, uh, and uh, it takes the part of the uh, Title Five of the Treaty of the European Union on external action and the value. Okay, now we see why conditionality, close and values applies to culture. So it is important when talking about the European external relation and. Uh, with third countries and the neighbor, the human rights clause. So the EU set to contribute to the protection of human rights and to advance democracy in the rule of law, all value upon which the EU is based through action on international scene. So we'll see that uh, when the EU is trying, you know, to um, strengthen uh, its relation with the neighbor country, it applies in uh, the instrument uh, uh, employed uh, between the EU and this country, this closed, uh, so this uh, discipline uh, in the documents uh, uh, and the, the new form of the conditionality, we will not go in details with that, it's a commercial conditionality, markets access conditionality. So I give you, uh, I don't know, to, so to say now Montenegro, the access uh, to sell your product in the EU and ex in exchange, you have to adopt some laws, uh, migration integration conditionalities also like visa liberalization. Um, it, it, those in, are important, um, this conditionality clause in human rights and rule of law that uh, uh, I showed you before, because uh, um, it is becoming uh, an, um, something that as, as we, uh, doctrine of EU is in, in law, uh, let's say researchers, but also institutions um, are what we call the Luxembourg effect uh, and what we see the transformation of the EU in something else uh, and uh, um, the formation of something that is called the European identity. Uh, in an expression that I translated uh, into English uh, is that uh, the, the court normally and he always does it in the in integration of the view that throw the art over the obstacles. So in a, um, let's say this year uh, famous uh, judgment, uh, uh, the court said that the values contained in this article were rule of law, democracy, etc. They define the European identity. Is for those who are not familiar with European law, is the first time that the EU is talking about European identity is the first time ever. So it's a very, very important judgment. And you understand how we link it with that. Uh, if you look at the old uh, regulation uh, establishing the European neighbors instruments, uh, uh, this regulation that they establish say that by, uh, the EU needs to develop special relationship with the uh, countries uh, on cooperation, peace, security, mutual accountability to the universal values of democracy, rule of law, respect of human rights in accordance with the TEU that we saw now that is part, is becoming part of something very important that is European identity. If we see paragraph four of this article say that accordingly funding under this regulation should comply with those values and principle as well as with the union's commitment under international law, taking into account relevant union policy and position. So it means that all the, uh, these policy projects, no? and now you are starting to understand, uh, funded by these regulations and needs to comply with, nonetheless, we can say now in modern terms, so European identity. And this is why we find this link uh, if we see Article 2, 
European support. Uh, it's based on partnership, cooperation agreements. Those are the instruments uh, imply, uh, employed by the EU with the uh, neighboring countries. Um, agreements, so there exist in future agreements, joint agreed action plans and equivalent documents. Here we see the link with the other instrument that I'm talking about, uh, that is the SOC law. Uh, creating condition for better organization, legal migration, uh, etc. And what they do here in Article 2 of this regulation, uh, paragraph uh, letter C, is that we aim to do that, so European identity, by promoting uh, people to people contacts, uh, relation to culture, education, profession, and sportive activities. So you see how that is going. Um, then the, uh, I can hear there is some sound in the background. Is it is it okay? Hello. It's can okay. It's okay. You can go. Yeah. On. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So um, this uh, regulation and the European uh, neighborhood policy uh, has changed, and how has changed? Has changed in the sense that the role of culture. It's becoming more and more important. And then it comes with soft law instruments. Joint communication, uh, briefly, what is soft law? You will see it. It's something that is not binding. So treaties uh, following a certain procedure established by member states are binding. You're obliged. Soft law is something that is not binding. So if you don't follow this, it means nothing happens, right? But they are an important part of the EU in this policy. And what they say when they review is they talk about cross-culture, culture, the dialogue, uh, the role of cultural identity, tradition, uh, that play a crucial role. And how we do it, we do it promoting intercultural dialogue, cultural diversity, mutual understanding. Again, uh, another review of that. Uh, um, this is Mogherini, the former, uh, let's say, head of uh, Euro external relations. Uh, say the societal links in its mobility, culture, and educational exchange, research cooperation, civil society platform. As we see, they give more and more importance to that. And then finally, the last one a new agenda from the Mediterranean. And then the EU will promote the rule of law, culture. Attention, rule of law, going identity and then culture, through close involvement of civil society and business community, civil society organization and social partners organization remain key interlocutors for that. And this is how the EU perceive. And uh, if we look at the annex of these documents, what are the priorities of the EU? Are cross country issues through the deep substantive democracy, again, democracy, human rights, gender equality, fight against corruption. And then we link this regulation, this um, European identity with the uh, an instrument that is soft law. Uh, so one of these instruments implied that is the Union for the Medi Mediterranean. Why I'm talking for the Union for the Mediterranean? Because Montenegro is not part of the uh, European neighboring policy, but is part of the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, curiously. Oh, now, and you can see uh, the instrument employed, and the Union for the Mediterranean is one of them, but this is soft law. So, this is an instrument that found projects, uh, uh, create connection, uh, etc., etc., but it's not binding, so it's not based on a really hard policy. Um, just very briefly about soft law, but I think I will go a bit far, uh, faster on that. Uh, what is soft law? It's more this <laughs> legal <laughs> conversation. Uh, however, in Europe, we see that soft law is an important thing because uh, it, as an instrument uh, doesn't uh, comply uh, um, or doesn't involve uh, very hard work, let's say, in adopting it but reach a lot of objectives, you know, uh, because it can solve impending program, urgent uh, issues uh, by, you know, not quasi binding uh, commitments. So if the state doesn't follow it, or he follows this in, in his own culture way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't lose the face or face, uh, uh, let's say, important obligation. Uh, and these are the problems from a EU law perspective of using 
this kind of instrument because it can a bit disrupt the European law uh, legal order. And this is a problem for us. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to know that these instruments are used to fund cultural project and to pursue a certain policy, no? based on not binding instruments. Um, and then uh, the Union for the Veterinarian comes in this regulation uh, because in Article 2, you have the partnership, how they you know they fund this project, uh, and the Union Mediterranean so is included. Uh, and what they do, and they talk about that, is Article 6, multicultural programs, <laughs> which address challenges, common, uh, etc. So we can see now how everything goes to this regulation, the European Union policy. Um, and for those who doesn't know, this is a brief explanation of what is the Union for the Mediterranean. That is, you know, uh, uh, let's say, I mean, they call it intergovernmental uh, organization, but it's a soft law instrument. It's something that is not binding, uh, uh, doesn't have a clear policy of what they want to do, and doesn't always follow uh, his own agenda. It depends on the political will, so to say. However, they have a uh, strong willing to uh, the project reflecting EU values. So because the regulation, as we've seen in previous uh, slides, needs to comply with the European identity. So these countries need, if they want this money, uh, to uh, comply with what we saw the European identity as such. And it's interesting how they do. They have this labeling system for project, and that also includes cultural and art uh, programs, programs, as you can see here. And one of these, since I think I don't have a lot of time, is the uh, is this okay? Uh, is this creating a regional platform for the development of cultural and creative industries and cluster? Maybe some of you know it already, since you are more familiar with this. And uh, if you think that all these projects, all these projects are based on on one side not binding agreements, uh, but on the other side they need to comply from non binding agreements. Uh, with the European identity, you can see how the European is shaping uh, through culture and not by any instrument, uh, let's say the, the culture and the approximation of uh, its neighbor countries. So just some conclusion, uh, the problem is that the important culture and European cultural activities in, in developing the citizenship is important, but it's not backed up by specific discussion or how funded project promoter citizen participation and cultural initiative along had a central role anyway in EU politics of belonging. So it means that the EU is promoting uh, uh, its own identity, as you can clearly see from the regulation, where we connect all the dots through soft law instruments and uh, cultural projects uh, in legal terms. So I will uh, yeah, wait for your question if you have any, and thank you very much for your attention. Hope uh, I was not that boring in legal speaking terms. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Spera. Uh, so, talk, so, uh, okay. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the questions are going at the end, and now we have a presenter, Ms. Vanya Drljevic. Vanya, you still too, okay. Yeah. Yes. Hello oh, to everyone. Hello, yeah. everybody. Hello, hello to you. Hello, everybody. So, so uh, Ms. Drljevic will have a presentation Erasmus Plus as a means of cultural diplomacy. She's head of National Erasmus Plus office in Montenegro. A uh, couple um, sentences about you i i got a, a very long biography of yours and then i just took a couple of sentences out of it um she graduated from uh, ena school in paris i will not try to pronounce the name of your school i'm sorry <laughs> because it's in french uh, her career starts in um agency for international scientific educational and cultural cooperation 
are responsible for EU programs in education, Council of Europe uh, projects, UNESCO and Stability Pact in uh, 2001. As 2003, uh, she worked in Ministry of Education, Department of Higher Education, responsible for Tempus program. Currently, she is working as a head of National Erasmus Plus Office, the biggest EU program for the field of education. Ms. Drljevic took an active part in subcommittee meetings of European Union, Montenegro, with respect to uh, Montenegro accession to EU negotiation chapter 26. She was a member of various working groups in charge of drafting laws and strategies in the field of education. She has been an initiator of many different initiatives relevant to context uh, of higher education and development. She speaks English, Italian, and French and possesses a basic knowledge of German. Um, Ms. Drljevic, uh, welcome and please go ahead whenever you are ready. Okay, thank you. Can I, uh, I have a presentation, just... Uh... You... Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. We okay. Have, we have a presentation. Sorry for, for this, but there was some problem. I don't know what happened, but okay. Sorry for keeping you waiting, but um, okay. So my my task is to, to speak about the Erasmus Plus as a means of uh, cultural uh, diplomacy. Uh, within the conference, the role of art in international relations. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I have the opportunity to speak about this topic because uh, somehow I think that um, this is a topic that is not much uh, talked and dis discussed. It is somehow not because it, it, it does not matter, but uh, somehow it goes without saying. and. Uh, Somehow it shouldn't be uh, like that. Uh, as you all know that uh, Erasmus Plus uh, uh, is one of the program, biggest program of the European Union uh, named after Desiderius Erasmus Rotterdamus, uh, one of the uh, very famous uh, Dutch scholar, philosopher, theologian and uh, that it became uh, one recognizable uh, brand, uh, not only in Europe, but worldwide for uh, mostly linked to the mobility of uh, young people and uh, students. Um, the program uh, of such is uh, actually uh, the biggest program in the field of education. Uh, and education as such is in the heart of the program itself, but still uh, culture is represented, uh, although the culture is represented in uh, separate programs of EU uh, as well, still uh, we cannot help noticing that uh, culture and education have these uh, inextricable links and that one cannot go uh, without the, uh, the another. Um, I have to say that the program is a symbol of global uh, cooperation uh, uh, in which uh, 143 countries take part, so quite almost the whole world. So, uh, and the program that unites people from very different countries, very different regions uh, through the cooperation in different kinds of projects, initiati initiatives, and uh, trying to shape uh, also European cultural identity. I have to stress that the, 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 this year uh, Montenegro can also take part in one very important initiative of the European Union, which is called European University Alliances. And uh, uh, searching through this uh, list of uh, alliances, uh, I uh, came across one that is dealing with uh, arts uh, specifically, fine arts. And I was really, really uh, glad that uh, this uh, topic, topic is generally more and more uh, present in, in, in different uh, EU ed education programs. Um, 
not only does it uh, mean uh, uh, does it mean uh, just a symbol of global cooperation it is uh, also one program that uh, uh, is the key to successful internationalization uh, of the society i would say societies on the whole and um, it really uh, makes this link with, with the culture uh, in a very uh, good way uh, through different uh, multi-country and multi-regional uh, 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 pro programs and projects. Uh, I would uh, maybe uh, focus more on the exchange programs uh, that are, let's say, most popular and the, by which Erasmus uh, became a, a brand uh, worldwide. And uh, this program being in a way of soft power uh, that it was serving in a way uh, uh, as a kind of uh, informal uh, diplomacy because uh, mobility students, we always call them like uh, informal ambassadors of their countries abroad because uh, the program as such uh, really uh, uh, is aimed at fostering mutual understanding between nations and countries uh, through different cultural activities, although the culture as such is not in the center, it, 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 the education, it is uh, exchange uh, 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 where the emphasis is on education, uh, on uh, recognizing the study periods abroad, but still I, I, I think that, uh, and we, we can uh, witness that through um, our cooperation and talking with uh, young people that actually it is just a part of their uh, 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 part of the, the program, the, the, the biggest, uh, let's say, benefit that they get through this uh, uh, Erasmus exchange program is actually this uh, um, uh, exchange uh, of, in terms of uh, communication, uh, culture, different uh, habits. Uh, uh, speaking different languages, and it, in a way, it really surpasses that uh, basic level uh, uh, of just passing the exams. I would like to 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 I put this here a quote of a former State Department cultural diplomacy practitioner that says that cultural relations uh, grow naturally and organically with go without government intervention. It is like transactions transactions of trade and tourism, student flows, communication, book circulation, migration, media access, intermarriage, millions of daily cross-cultural encounters. And if that is correct, cultural diplomacy can only be said to take place when formal, diplom formal diplomats serving national governments try to shape and channel this natural flow to advance national interests. I have to say that also speaking about this intermarriage uh, uh, thing, uh, one is interesting detail from Erasmus that when celebrating 30 years of Erasmus five years ago, actually uh, uh, one survey was done and uh, in which uh, we got this data that uh, more than one million babies was born uh, as also a result of this program. Uh, this year is also important for the program because it is a kind of jubilee uh, celebrating 35 years of its existence. And of course, that, uh, that uh, unity in diversity is something which is um, very much uh, uh, stressed in the Erasmus program. And all these uh, uh, pictures, images that you see uh, since the... the, the conferences uh, in the field of art and culture. Actually, it was done by a Montenegrin um, artist, caricaturist, uh, for the purpose of uh, the program Erasmus Plus in Montenegro. Uh, so all of uh, these elements of Erasmus Plus program indirectly are aimed at fostering also this uh, intercultural uh, dialogue through especially uh, speaking about mobility program. And as I already said, these people are the best ambassadors of their countries. 
uh, uh, spreading the word about different countries and cultures through this mobility period. Periods is something really that matters and changes the perception of young people and uh, widens their perspective and enriches their life, as, as, as the very slogan says. And um, it is, um, we can say that Erasmus Plus uh, mobility has united different cultures and it's a very efficient uh, way to uh, cross-cultural communication and uh, helping to break prejudice, expand minds, uh, reconcile opposite points of view, overcome cultural barriers and embrace cultural differences, breaking uh, certain stereotypes that exist in some societies, resolving social conflicts and uh, learn foreign languages. And it is also a means of promoting democracy and equality. To illustrate this, uh, I would like to, to uh, say a few words about one survey that our office ma uh, made on impact of Erasmus Plus mobility on the students of Montenegro. So we, we uh, did it from different perspectives, but one of the questions was related uh, to the prejudice about the nations and cultures of the hosting countries prior to the mobility period. So we were very surprised when we received the, this answer saying that 88% of uh, young students uh, had prejudice about certain nations and countries like, uh, for example, with the uh, German uh, people saying, uh, one student said, I thought the German people are cold and unfriendly, but I realized that was not true when I was living there. Or the image of Turkey saying, uh, I imagine Turkish people to be very introvert and not helpful to others, but I made sure that it's actually quite the opposite, that they are very happy to help others and a more open-minded nation than I expected. The same goes with Polish people, for example, because uh, one student said I've not, it is actually, uh, we, we, we extracted some of the, the, the quotes of students that say I've perceived Polish people as cold and distant before going to Warsaw mobility, but during that period, I was proven otherwise, uh, and I was amazed by their progress in economic and technology terms since I expected Eastern Europe feel to the country. Then uh, of Bulgaria, image of Bulgaria that media sometimes presents, I don't find very true because in Bulgaria there are so many beautiful things to see, starting from natural beauty to people that are mostly kind and helpful. And also one other quote about Germany. So uh, we see that uh, that people before the, this mobility uh, they, it took place, they they had uh, uh, some kind of prejudice and very, very many prejudices about uh, different nations and culture. And we we also. Uh, so that uh, at the very beginning, this problem started in Montenegro, that people were more prone to, to apply for some countries that they know more, that are closer uh, in terms of geography, closer in terms of mentality or uh, uh, cl climate. Or So some countries were somehow underrepresented. We didn't know, uh, people didn't know about them but and uh, created certain prejudice or stereotypes about different nations. So we find it very positive that uh, this uh, changed uh, thanks to Erasmus. So uh, opening minds, like the slogan says, how does Erasmus Plus change the way of thinking of young, young people and how challenging it was for uh, the intercultural communication at the beginning of the mobility period? That was one of the questions for the students. Uh, and to, to see uh, if they think that mobility period improved their intercultural communication skills. Also, we, uh, majority of students, almost 70% said that it was uh, actually uh, very challenging, uh, but not anymore. And definitely intercultural communication skill, uh, skills were very much uh, improved. So. This is uh, the program that really brings people together, people from very different cultures and create opportunities for cultures to get to know each other, um, 
It is a recognition that often breaks prejudice and stereotypes that students come up with. Uh, it improves their intercultural communication skills, uh, intercultural to tolerance, and uh, open minds, raise the level of tolerance and affection towards uh, culturally di diverse members. Oops. And uh, I would like to, to, to uh, mention also one part of the program uh, called Jean Monet, called by uh, the uh, Jean Omer Marie uh, Gabriel Monet, uh, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, uh, that uh, and one program of EU that is uh, uh, aimed at uh, uh, European integration process and promoting European Union studies worldwide is uh, carries his name and. Uh, Actually, uh, in one of his uh, interviews, when he was asked, I, I don't know whether it, I, I put it correctly, but more paraphrase, when he said, if I were to, to do it all over again, to start from the beginning, I would start with culture. So it is, uh, I think that uh, what, what previous speaker said, Mr. Uh, Spera, uh, where he was speaking about different policies and documents in which uh, European Union uh, is mentioning uh, uh, shaping of uh, European uh, identity. I think it is uh, very much important that it uh, uh, gets on importance also in explicit terms. Although, as we, we could see from, from, from here, that uh, through this program, mobility, uh, I, I put focus on mobility, but it's not just that, From, uh, but uh, through all these actions uh, in the field of education, you have these um, uh, elements of uh, uh, culture that, and these two are very much interlinked, but it is very good that it is also uh, getting on, uh, on importance even more, uh, because uh, Europe is not only uh, we, we are very often speaking much about the economy, about the markets, about programs in line with with the labor market. But it is not uh, Europe is not only about it. It is also about um, values, and uh, I think uh, that actually the culture is uh, what, in a way, makes. Uh, uh, our life more beautiful and uh, worth living. It's something that surpasses this uh, certain certain levels. So I uh, I will finish with this. Uh, I didn't want to speak about specific actions uh, promoted by the programs, but if you have any uh, any questions, uh, I'm here and happy to answer. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Miss Panya. Um... Now we have a Q&A session um, for the next couple of minutes or discussion among the, the um, participants of the this session. Right? Should I write or I... Go ahead, please. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Uh, did you, Francesco, hear the presentation, the first presentation about uh, Regina Elena? Uh, uh, and uh, some historical part of, of her as a connection between Italy and Montenegro. And uh, so I would like to say that these this, uh, new connections that we are now having here between Montenegro and Puglia um, in this Adriatic Union region really have some substance uh, in the history. So it's not something what is created now in this last decade or two. It's really something is based on some longer connections. So I would like to, to ask you, what do you think about that? And do you, do you see these connections in that, in that sense? Do you see a culture uh, as a base for, for this communication and future connections? Thanks. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear all the presentation uh, from uh, Professor Mirovitz. Mirovitz, is, is it like that? Uh, um, but uh, um, I heard like I um, something interesting. Uh, and first of all, 
I would point it like this, ignorance. Like at least here in Italy, we know few, I don't know what Professor Minovitz discovered about, but in the public opinion, I think few people remember that. <laughs> I don't think my grandparents probably, I don't know. But uh, what was, uh, um, what is uh, interesting is that uh, we, had, with Montenegro, uh, we have a story linked more with uh, Yugoslavian times. Uh, for uh, probably, yeah, we saw the, the shopping street in Bari, etc., etc., but put it in a more conceptual uh, case. Um, I think um, the fact that now we are rediscovering the Montenegro uh, culture and country, and uh, uh, let's say any kind of sort of relation. Uh, uh, I think it's an appeal for Italians uh, to, to discover more the proxies, you know, because we have been, especially uh, after the 90s, uh, influenced by this fear of the Balkans, you know, this thing that anything bad will come from the Balkans and, uh, so to say, drugs, immigration, war and uh, confusions and uh, so on. Of course, maybe Puglia has this perception, I would say, uh, if we are talking about perceptions. However, now it's changing. However, now it's shifting on the let's say, wide Mediterranean Sea, where the danger uh, is coming from North Africa, and uh, the Balkans are, come, are more like an opportunity now for Italians, you know, and especially for people from Puglia, uh, without talking about Albania. So I think now that this, uh, let's say, cultural uh, limitations are given by, the, of course, uh, language, ling linguistic uh, wall between us. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's a bit narrowing down uh, because it's just a perceptions. Um, we have so many common problems and issue from the other side of the Adriatic that uh, that linguistic part uh, is just you know doesn't matter anymore. In that sense, also because we have English now to communicate, as probably was not the case in the past, um, and I'm, I'm sure people are more willing to learn uh, Balkan, let's say, languages. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I I hope this doesn't uh, offend anyone if I say Balkan language, because I uh, uh, met some 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 girls at my university while learning Croatian. They told me we are learning Croatian. <laughs> I mean, it's it really 10 years ago was impossible to hear that. So you will just expect uh, that people learn Italian if you come from a small country in the Balkans. But as uh, probably Natasha knows already, um, like I have friends working in Albania who knows Albania, my generation, but it was impossible with the previous Italians, <laughs> the, 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 our fathers. So now I think uh, thanks also to different, let's say, I would say economic crisis, I would say different phases and the cultural development, uh, we are rediscovering something that was already there. So we didn't discover America, <laughs> but we are discovering something there. That, and what, once we discover it, we see how Many things are in common. Already, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, first of all, linguistics, you know better than me. But in terms of, for instance, uh, maybe uh, Professor Mirovitz knows uh, uh, low approximations, uh, Montenegro is giving, oh, at least I read the last uh, report on rule of law. It's one of the best examples in the Western Balkans. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I think in terms of low approximation is going better. Uh, cultural, uh, it, so to say, we have to, and uh, um, so can I say professor, the Drilievitz, Drilievitz, professor, can I say that? Yeah, uh, she, she made a good point. We need to stress, it. we need to stress the role of culture because it's always uh, there, but uh, no one has, um, address it, you know, no one has put the importance of it, because built in civil society among us cross border is the first step then to build the legal framework afterwards. I don't know. Yeah, correct me 
if I say that something wrong or uh, not or not uh, in line uh, with your thought. But this is my idea, talking about the legal side. I don't know if I answer, <laughs> if you, you expected this answer, but OK. Yeah. But you can right. call me Francesco, to be honest. <laughs> OK. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spera. <laughs> Uh, I would like to to ask um, Andrea. So, so from the uh, professional perspective, you have you you know who who Kralica Elena, Regina Elena is. But what do you, as as a young person, uh, how do you see the uh, her you know importance for our culture? Um. I told before that Yelena is the, I think for me, is the most uh, interesting person for relation between Montenegro and Italy. In that period, <coughs> when Yelena was born and when her was young, uh, Montenegro uh, wasn't open country for some Westerns, other Westerns country. Uh, uh, King Nicola had 12 children, uh, all daughters. King Nicola decided to marry it to some uh, big, uh, some uh, important uh, kings, uh, presidents of that time. And Yelena had that influence that uh, she was uh, first queen of Italy f from, from this area. And because of that, I think that um, he, she is very important for our relations. Uh, Mr. Spera told that uh, young Italian uh, don't know a, a lot of about, about Regina Elena. I hope, uh, I think that if we want to build some new connection in culture between Montenegro and Puglia, Montenegro and Italy, we must now our history, history of our relations and history of relations of our culture. I told uh, Mr. Spera, uh, uh, didn't uh, hear that, that uh, maybe you heard for Amaro Montenegro liquor from 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 Italy that liquor uh, Queen Regina Elena is Amaro Montenegro liquor have name because of of influence of Regina Elena two hospitals in Italy one in Cassel and one in Rome have name Regina Regina Elena uh, I spoke about uh, some terrible earthquake on Sicilia at, in uh, 1908, when uh, 10 of thousand uh, islanders from Sicilia died. Yelena was queen in that period and she decided to take nurse uniform and go to, to Sicilia to help people. Uh, because of that, I think that, uh, that Yelena influenced uh, in Italy and in Montenegro, that is the most important person for our for our history, and I hope future connection in in cultural cooperation. Before um, five six years, uh, I was in some um, movie I can say movie about Queen Yelena and her and her um, husband King Vittorio Emanuele. And because of that, I decided uh, today to speak about this connection. Because I think, again, say she is the most important person for our history with Italy, with connection with Italy. I, I hope, hope also, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good answer. answer. Right. Thank you. And I have something to add. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, Vanya, please, ask for us. Sorry, I, did, uh, I didn't want to, to take uh, advantage of, but um, actually I just wanted to, to, to comment, on, uh, comment on this uh, presentation of uh, uh, Professor Mirovic 
I think it's very important this uh, link between Italy and Montenegro uh, through uh, uh, Regina Elena. Uh, and uh, I have to mention that because I personally uh, also witnessed uh, uh, quite a lot how uh, she is a person very much respected also in Italy. It is true that not all uh, generations know so much, but still uh, the very fact that uh, uh, Professor said that there are two um, uh, hospitals named by her, that there is the, the monument in Messina, a uh, very beautiful monument in Messina dedicated to Queen Elena, that it is the Scuola Principessa Mafalda, named after the daughter of uh, Regina Elena also speaks of for itself. And uh, I have to say that uh, I say I personally witnessed because uh, during uh, uh, my husband's diplomatic mission in Rome, uh, I took part in um, one, um, in one uh, uh, let's say, a visit to Sicily, uh, where I found out that uh, and I was really surprised uh, that there is one uh, small town which is called uh, Milena, uh, named after uh, the mother of uh, uh, Regina Elena, just because uh, they really appreciated much her commitment, especially during the earthquake uh, in Sicily. And they decided to, to, to name one of the, of the uh, small uh, towns uh, in Sicily by, by her mother and I. And then once uh, this uh, mission, diplomatic missions, uh, was uh, finished, uh, uh, I mean, it's not the, the time promoting uh, my husband this way, but I, I found it really very nice that he launched initiative to erect the monument to, to Regina Elena that was done actually uh, as, as uh, the anniversary of 140 years of diplomatic relations and uh, uh, between Italy and Montenegro. And I think that it is the best uh, uh, way to promote our countries through these cultural links that really uh, 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 do exist uh, between the two countries, not only in terms of distance, which is a small distance, not only in terms of language that we very much like. We can see oh, many, many different places called by Italian names and not only by fashion, and uh, but also through culture, art, history, and many, uh, many other things uh, that we have, uh, have in common and to break this prejudice about uh, one small country from the Balkans where there is always something going on, uh, wars and these things that are uh, not nice. So that is just my comment, sorry if I was too long. Everything is fine. Marco, you had a question as well. Yes, it's, uh, it's more comments than a question uh, about uh, young people in Italy because I was uh, two months in Torino before I came back for 15 days and there I met a lot of young people, uh, people that uh, I talked with them about uh, Elena and Elena Savoyska, and uh, they didn't know uh, much much about uh, about the Queen, the Queen Elena. And I uh, went to the Museo Reale and in Torino and Villa della Regina, uh, the place where uh, the Savoia uh, castles in, in in the town. And I tried to find uh, some information there in. Uh, in that museums, uh, and I I couldn't find anything, and it was it was very weird because uh, Elena and Vittoria Manuela was uh, were the the last rulers uh, in, in Italy, and uh, I don't know the reason, and I think that that is the one reason that young people uh, don't know uh, much about uh, about uh, her and. Uh, uh, so if I, that's the, the uh, also the question is everybody anybody know why is that you know it's it's not very uh, involved in the in the recent history and in the museum of, of the town so just that was just the comment and the question in same time. I would like to add something, uh, Vanya. We will have to think about some Erasmus programs that they will uh, culturally oriented, that they will link this historical part with this new 
uh, definitely we need to, to, to think in that direction because it's a very important tool for us and, and it should be it should be known. Um, I, um, the question that I would like to ask you uh, is, I think we discussed that even earlier somewhere, uh, that um, there is a space for, for cultural programs, but there is, there is none, or there is a very few of them active currently when we talk about Montenegro. Um, uh, I think there is, a, uh, we can talk about passive cultural sector always, but we maybe can uh, as well talk about uh, uh, not clear understanding of the cultural sector from the side of the people who are creating all, all these projects. What do you think uh, can, we, can, we, can we do in, on this regard so we can actually exercise this, this, these tools much, much more than we do here in, in our country? Mm. Okay, uh, that, that is uh, true. Uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, it is uh, the program in, in these activities where we uh, uh, can participate now as a partner country or as it's by new terminology now we are third country non-associated to the program. But speaking in for in terms of higher education and many possibilities offered through this uh, part of the program, uh, I think that it is underrepresented in a way. Uh, I can say that uh, uh, maybe partly it is because uh, acad academies awards they are not so uh, let's say not not so many people uh, 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 enroll these uh, academies so. Uh, somehow the impact might be uh, in terms of, I mean, in the perception of people that would like perhaps to apply, they think, okay, it's, uh, we are uh, less important because at some faculty of economics, for example, you have many more students or the faculty of law or political sciences and so on. But still, I think that uh, uh, we should not think think in that way. And I uh, think that uh, through this uh, new uh, uh, way, uh, new concept of Erasmus Plus, uh, where they, through capacity building in higher education, they have strength one, which is for newcomers and uh, for those who are not so much present, who are not so much experienced in a program, they didn't take part. Uh, I think I can see there uh, the role of, uh, uh, of the academies to develop some, something, uh, but also not only through that, but through all the other actions, of course, mobility programs also that I mostly that I used already by some of academies very well. But also through this Jean Monnet, for me, this is really something that I think could be used very much in um, for for this uh, uh, culture and uh, arts. Uh, and uh, for that, for for that being so, we also, as a, an office, uh, uh, last year uh, organized one event for Jean Monnet, inviting professor from University of Belgrade, uh, University of uh, uh, Fine Arts, or Université Lipik Umetnosti, to speak about the project Jean Monnet project uh, in musicology uh, uh, that is focused on EU integration through musicology, through music. So, uh, and it was the second, actually, the project uh, um, uh, fi financed by uh, by uh, Erasmus Plus. So I think that uh, this, there is a space, but somehow we have also to, to break our prejudice in our heads that uh, uh, something which is where there, there are more students that is more important. I think that we should not think that way because uh, uh, I, I think what 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 uh, uh, previously Francesco mentioned and what we mentioned that the fact the very fact that uh, now we we put more an emphasis on 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 culture generally in all the uh, documents uh, although it is always there but still somehow to to to, to uh, make more attention put more attention to that to that and also through these uh, political dialogues uh, that are taking place in the Western Balkan platform uh, agenda, uh, now with education, they, they put also culture. I think it is, it is also some step further 
And I think that it would be a good signal for, for people that are from these fields to start uh, uh, making projects from, uh, from these fields. And I was really happy to see that this European Universities Initiative Alliances, uh, which is uh, one of the most ambitious uh, initiatives by the European Commission and uh, really visionary one, uh, that I saw that out of 41 alliances, there is one which is dedicated to, to the EU for Arts, it's called, uh, where four universities from EU, it's from um, uh, Rome, Dresden, uh, Budapest, and the fourth is from uh, Riga, uh, where they uh, actually uh, uh, have this... Um, alliance around uh, the topic of arts, uh, fine arts, uh, paintings, culture. And uh, when you read more about this initiative, you will see how broad it is. And it is not just a project, it's a long-term vision. And uh, there is the possibility also for our university to get involved, to get connected to already existing uh, uh, alliances because uh, more budget is um, de dedicated to those already existing uh, and uh, a small portion for, for completely new ones. So that could be one of, uh, let's say, ways to, to, to get connected. I think that all these opportunities are really wonderful and can serve the purpose of uh, uh, getting uh, culture and arts uh, at the position it deserves in, in, in society. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanya. Um, well, with this, if nobody uh, has any questions, uh, More, yeah. we, we will finish the go ahead Marco. yeah yeah sir yeah um, ah. if i may can i okay yes 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 Francesco. okay so first of all i want to react to what uh, was said about uh marco gosovic uh said about um yeah the, what was it the memory of uh, the regina yes so the problem the problem is that uh, this is a very interesting point, though. And, uh, probably Professor Mirovic will uh, agree with that. Um, this is a different memory, historical perception from the other side of the Mediterranean. Remember that she was the last queen, and why she was the last? Because she was she was there when the husband the king of Italy declared war to the French, <laughs> to the British, right? And when the Italians, no, when the, the Second World War was over, half of Italians, a bit, a bit slightly more half than Italians, decided to get rid of uh, monarchy because they perceived, I'm saying half of Italians plus one, they perceived that monarchy uh, collaborated for 20 years with the fascism and all the bad things that happen afterwards, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, do not underestimate that. Do not underestimate that because of fascism, uh, we lost, I, let me use this, okay? Uh, but we lost uh, part of our, our countries, uh, Istria, you know, this part of Croatia, Slovenia, we lost islands in Greece. This memory in part of the Italian population is very important. And that, that followed very tragic humanitarian crisis uh, with thousand Italians, 100,000 Italians coming from those regions with the uh, Tito, let's say, army going and taking uh, that parts. And all that was attributed to the kings. Because they didn't allow, uh, they allowed Mussolini to be there in power for all this time. And uh, the communist, Italian communist, uh, all this against, uh, you know, anti fascist, uh, they perceived the king and the queen uh, as part of these uh, mistakes, uh, these uh, tragic events. Uh, and that's why it will not be commemorated because uh, in, we don't have a shared 
memory of the good queen because she was there during the declaration of war. So I don't know whether that can be, and this is interesting because I can perceive uh, on the other side of the Adriatic another memory of what, but you know, history is different from memory of people, uh, but it, our, let's say Republican state was built against monarchy. Uh, so um, maybe, and that maybe can trigger you something, uh, it's we can build our relation culturally speaking, but I will not too much bet on the monarchy past because uh, uh, maybe you have 10% of Italians and I'm very surprised that uh, you were in uh, Torino where you can find most of the monarchists, but the rest of Italians don't like monarchy at all. I would say <laughs> they want probably some strong men or women. Uh, we'll see if this one is <laughs> the Messiah. <laughs> but uh, talking about monarchy, no. Uh, kings and queens, this thing, this topic in Italy, no. I would say it's divisive. A very div no, you, you will not find a lot of people supporting it. They have shared respect for the British monarchy, but Italian monarchy is... Uh, no, because it led yes. us to the failing of what is now Italy. Yes. Uh, All right. it, it's it's I'm not oh. history. And sorry, can I have a question? Just a small, small question. Uh, because I talk about the Union of Mediterranean, where Montenegro is part. May I ask you to those who are, who are more experienced with project, why Medita I didn't find uh, Montenegro involved, uh, at least maybe I didn't uh, search well, I didn't find Montenegro involved in the Union of Mediterranean project. I don't know, is it neglect, neglecting? Or wh why was that? I, I was very surprised by that. So thank you very much. Sorry, took <laughs> a bit more time. Well, I, I'm not sure who can answer the, the Francesco's question, but Marco did wanted to make a comment too. No, 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 I just want to thank you, but uh, <laughs> just to, to... <laughs> to, 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 to tell you what I expected when I go to the Museum of uh, History of uh, Kingdom, I expected to see everything, <laughs> you know, and I was surprised that I didn't see one period at all, so that's why I asked that. So, yes, you, you clarify, you clarify that. No, now you know. But, but <laughs> I, I would just add one more thing, Marco. It's not much different situation in, in, in this part of the world as well. We like to forget the part of history as well. And then pretend it never yes. happened. I think yes. it, it's not characteristic only for it's one nation. It's something that we all do. But I really think that these ties needs to be, that, that, that we, our generation needs to reflect on this, all these issues and maybe you know, discuss about it from from a distance, from historical distance, number one, and from uh, any other emotional or, I don't know, traditional um, distance. Okay, I think we are running out of time. Sorry, Balsh. We are running out of time. Uh, we have next section, session in um, around 20 minutes. So uh, I would like to conclude this um, this fourth. This is the fourth session. Um, so uh, if there is no more question, uh, I would just like to make uh, one one more comment uh, from all this that I heard from yesterday and today. We kind of uh, have a lot, a lot to learn from each other uh, and to to see the. Um, events and the th things in general from different perspectives and more we learn that that's better uh so uh with that i would like to uh, go out <laughs> finish finish the session and i guess i'll see you all uh, back in around 20 minutes and yes uh natasha and our colleague marco gosevich will be mediators for for next session to come yes bye bye everybody bye. thank you bye. very much thank you very much thank you bye